I'm Tom Armstrong. I'm a surgeon in Southampton, <laughs> and uh, we form the Wessex Net Group, which is a centre of excellence, which I will uh, talk about shortly. And we work very closely with Planets, which is a patient support group and charity in, in our area. So the way that we've set our centre of excellence up is it's all based around uh, a weekly multidisciplinary team meeting we have in Southampton. And we run joint clinics in Portsmouth at Queen Alexandra Hospital and also in um, uh, Bournemouth. Um, and the various hospitals that within our area feed into these uh, MDTs and clinics. And really the centre of what we do, it's about central decision making that benefits patients by having all of the experts involved, but trying to treat them as close to home as possible. So we became a centre of excellence in 2015 and we've recently been recertified. But as I've said to you before, Planet um, is, is very much a key partner in that group and, uh, and one of the main reasons that we are a centre of excellence in our area. So I just want to run through a few things to make sure that you understand the terminology that I'm going to use when I'm talking. So when we're talking about treatments, um, there is systemic treatments and those treatments treat any um, neuroendocrine cell in the body. So there are things like somatostatin analogs, chemotherapy or peptide receptor radiotherapy. Then there's local regional treatments, and that's aimed at one particular area of the body. So surgery would be a good example for that, or embolization to the liver. When we talk about cytoreductive surgery, some people call it debulking surgery. That's the aim of removing the, the bulk of the disease, but we still leave some small volume disease behind. And when I talk about multimodal therapy, that's where we combine a number of treatments uh, uh, one after the other or sometimes together. And, and when we're discussing whether a neuroendocrine tumour is functioning or non-functioning, a non-functioning tumour doesn't make any hormones or factors that cause a syndrome, but a functioning tumour, uh, an example of that would be an insulinoma that makes too much insulin that inappropriately lowers the blood sugar and makes you feel faint and shaky or the classic carcinoid tumour, which is the one that's usually derived from the small bowel and causes flushing. So when we're thinking about how we treat our patients, we, the, the most important thing is that we get a handle on the stage of the disease and what we're dealing with. And the important parts of that are to get a, a, a feel for the proliferation index. We call that the key 67 index, and that's a measure of the number of cells that are dividing at any one time. As you'll all probably know, most neuroendocrine tumours, the proliferation index is below 10 or 20%. Um, when we're dealing with other cancers like bowel cancer and lung cancer, then that proliferation index is usually about 80 to 90%. Um, the, the functionality of the tumour that I've mentioned, and also we can't, not every patient is the same. Some patients have other medical problems, uh, and that plays into the treatments that we consider uh, when we're um, uh, planning treatment. So when we have all that information, we discuss a case uh, or a patient's case very thoroughly. And we've got multiple different treatment modalities. We've got um, somatostatin analogs like lanreotide. We've got surgery that's either with curative or cytoreductive intent. We've got different forms of liver embolization. We've got ablation, we've got chemotherapy. We've got other treatments like everolimus and sinitinib and peptide receptor radiotherapy. And our mindset is very much about trying to get the disease under control within the first year or two, reduce the burden of disease, set the clock back if you like on the disease, and then hopefully move into a follow-up phase over the, the, the years to come. Uh, where we monitor the situation and intervene where necessary. So that's really the philosophy of, of our group and, and the point of view that I come from. So why are liver metastases important in net patients? Well, it's a fact that with liver metastases, impact on prognosis in many cancer types, and it's the same in neuroendocrine tumours. And one of the things that's particularly interesting and important about neuroendocrine liver mets is that if, if we take, for example, a, a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor that is causing carcinoid syndrome, 
the, those proteins that cause the flushing aren't actually felt by the body until the, the tumour has actually spread to the liver because the liver filters out those factors before it gets to the main circulation. So it's only when the metastases get to the liver that the syndrome is felt. And, and in the case of the midgut neuroendocrine tumours uh, and the carcinoid syndrome, that is what can affect the heart valves in the right side of the heart and cause problems uh, with uh, regurgitation and the so-called carcinoid heart disease. So um, when we're looking at thinking about how we manage neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases, we have to think about whether the disease is um, local to the liver or whether it's spread elsewhere, but also particularly about the proliferation index of the tumor, the key 67 index of the tumor because this is very important in informing what treatments work. And generally those grade three tumors uh, respond best to being treated with chemotherapy, whereas the lower grade, more um, localized tumors often benefit from surgery with curative intent. But the vast majority fall into this group where we use many different types of treatment uh, against the tumor. So the treatment options we have for liver mets, um, in, in, for neuroendocrine liver mets are, um, can be broadly categorized into ones that are local, regional or systemic. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about the systemic therapies. Those are uh, some mastatin analogs, chemotherapy, peptide receptor radiotherapy, and other drugs such as Everolimus that we use in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I'm going to concentrate on where we can help with the local regional treatment such as surgery, embolization, ablation, and liver transplant. So we classify neuroendocrine tumor liver metastases um, broadly by their distribution within the liver. The liver is an organ, it's a big organ that sits in the right upper part of the abdomen and it's split into two lobes, the right lobe and the left lobe. Normally the right lobe can, comprises about 60% of the volume, but sometimes that's higher. And so when metastases are confined to a single lobe of the liver, we call that type one distribution. When there's mainly in one side of the liver, but there's a small one or two in the other side of the liver, we call that type two. More commonly, what we see in neuroendocrine tumors is that they affect both lobes of the liver and there are sometimes a variety of different sizes of tumors uh, within the liver. And each of those different patterns lends itself better to different forms of treatment. So I think you're probably getting the idea that actually this is quite a complex area and there's no simple answer for, that applies to every patient. It's very much a, a case by case, a patient by patient um, uh, um, management plan that's required. So this is, uh, the schema that we base our decision making on, which is published by the uh, uh, European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. And for so for the simple lower grade tumors, then resection is the mainstay of treatment when the pattern of tumors affect both lobes of the liver, then more major surgery or a combination of surgery and ablation or embolization is required. But when they're more diffuse, then we're looking more perhaps at some local regional therapies, but also systemic therapies and perhaps liver transplantation. And I will get onto that a little bit later. So I'm gonna talk about surgery for liver mets and uh, first of all, for neuroendocrine tumors. And th there is some traditional things that all surgeons learn, especially of my generation through their career. And this is about if we're going to do an operation, we do it with the aim of curing people. So, and by doing what we mean by that is to treat all visible disease that's on a scan. And we can only see tumors that are about the size of a pea or bigger. So sometimes we just don't appreciate smaller disease. And that's why we often give patients with um, other sorts of cancer like bowel cancer, pancreatic cancer, once they've had surgery, they're given chemotherapy to treat any disease that we can't see on a scan, which is called micrometastatic disease. So that's the traditional model. But with neuroendocrine tumors, we need a completely different mindset. And I think that that's uh, the, the message that we're trying to spread to, to everybody. And I think um, we're quite well ahead of the game in the UK, if I'm honest with you. 
So when we're thinking about surgery for neuroendocrine tumors in general, it, it's, it, we obviously set out to cure patients of disease if possible, but mostly it's about setting the clock back, reducing the disease burden, trying to keep people as well as possible for as long as possible by keeping syndrome under control, operating on the bowel to remove obstructing tumors and to prevent things like carcinoid heart disease becoming a problem. But none of the decision making in this is straightforward and it really does need a multidisciplinary team to, to consider it. Now for the next slides, I don't want you to consider too much on the, uh, the, the actual numbers that are attached to this because the reality of this data is it's all quite out of date now. And we don't use any of these treatments in isolation. They are used um, uh, together and sequentially. But what you can see is that if we are able to operate and remove disease, that that really can confer a good survival benefit to patients. And that's particularly true if you look at this diagram on the right hand side here for the patients with small intestinal, neuro small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and if we can remove all of the disease, that's a benefit. And similarly, don't look at the numbers too much here. It's about trying to illustrate a point. One of the problems we have when we're trying to guide you all on what the best treatment is, is that we don't have really strong evidence because patients tend to live a long time with neuroendocrine tumors. It makes it very difficult for us to study individual treatments over a short time frame. And when these are com com combined with other treatments, then it makes it very difficult to compare two groups simply. But the message from this is that if we can offer surgery and um, uh, ablation and perhaps embolization, then we can improve the outlook. And I think that we have a quite an aggressive mindset in our part of the world trying to pursue these options where we can. But the honest answer is that we don't have definite answers to know that what we're doing is correct. So when we're thinking about these, making decisions and offering treatment options um, when we're in our MDT, there are some things that uh, encourage us to offer surgery and there are some things that make us think, actually, we're not sure whether that's going to be of benefit. So when we're looking at uh, the lower grade tumors, so those with a proliferation index of less than 20%, those with the distribution that we might be able to offer uh, resection for. Um, it's very difficult for us as surgeons to remove lots of tiny tumors, but if there are a few large ones, that's a very good situation for surgery. We have a lower threshold to offer surgery to those patients who've got a syndrome, because even if we remove 50% of the tumors, that can reduce the flushing and other problems that patients have. Uh, we, when we're thinking about surgery, we tend to stick to patients who've only got secondary deposits in the liver, but that's not entirely true. And of course, whenever we're considering surgery, we need to consider patients' ability to bounce back from that and their quality of life afterwards and the risks of complications sometimes that are very serious around the time of surgery. So, uh, it, it, you know, there is an, we need to do the right thing for people, that one treatment's not right for everybody. Um, generally speaking, um, we would try and remove more than 70% of the disease in the liver. And um, that would be the sort of figure that we would be looking for when we were offering surgery. As I've shown you before, that the, the small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors tend to behave slightly more predictably than the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. But these are this is not black and white rules. This is, this is just some of the factors that we have to consider when we're thinking about whether surgery is a good treatment option for a patient. Now, it's very important that when we're considering surgery that we do it in the right environment. And I'm strongly of the view that uh, and, and it's best to be looked after by a surgeon who has an interest and, and an understanding in NETS and where the role of an operation has been defined by the multidisciplinary team. One of the things we worry about when we're doing these operations is causing what we call a carcinoid crisis, which is where the factors and the proteins that make you flush when we start handling the liver can be produced in much greater quantities that can cause significant 
problems with heart rate and blood pressure at the time of surgery. So uh, we use octreotide infusions and we work in a team of specialists who all have different um, skills to bring to the table that allows this surgery to be safe. Now, just to give you a, a bit of an idea about liver surgery, if, if we consider the liver is a very anatomical organ, it doesn't necessarily look like that, but there's uh, arterial and venous blood flow going into it and there's venous drainage going from it. And it, it's broadly split into eight segments. So if we have a tumor on the edge of the liver, it's very easy for us to remove that tumor with a relatively small part of the liver. But if that same single tumor is situated in the center of the liver near the blood flow going into the right side of the liver, then it becomes necessary for us to remove the whole right side of the liver. And similarly, if, it's, if a single tumor is near the veins that drain, for example, the left side of the liver here, we then have to remove the whole of the left side of the liver. So a single deposit, depending on its position within the liver, has quite a profound effect on what we need to do. And, and you know, operating and removing half the liver is clearly a much bigger operation than removing a small tumour from the edge of the liver. More often than not, this is the picture we see with neuroendocrine tumours, but that's okay. We've, um, we, we, what we do, and this is, forgive me for my operative pictures, but we literally can go through and remove these tumours. And in some cases, 20 or 30 tumours of varying sizes. And this is what the liver looks like uh, when we finished the end of the operation. So if I'm saying to you that surgery is good, how do we offer more patient surgery? Well, I think that one of the things that sometimes the physicians and oncologists are concerned about is that surgery is, you know, uh, has a risk of serious complications and can affect your quality of life. I think that certainly that's true, but I think the risks are somewhat less uh, today than they were 10 years ago. I think that we need to think of liver surgery as part of a local regional strategy combined with embolization and ablation. And sometimes when we're operating on the liver, we can also remove the primary tumor, which um, uh, might not be considered uh, uh, sometimes. Um, and the other thing I would just like to say, concluding on this, I, I don't think there's any rush to recommend surgery. I think those patients who benefit most from surgery, their disease doesn't necessarily move forwards quickly and, and rushing in right at the beginning, you might end up having an operation that with the benefit of hindsight doesn't actually uh, 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 benefit you in the long term. We have some amazing things we can do to the liver to try and help us offer surgery, there's a procedure we do called a portal vein embolization. So if you remember, if we have a situation where all of the tumors were in the right lobe of the liver at the beginning, and rather than this being 60% of the volume of the liver, it made up 80% of the volume and the, the left side was really too small in its own right to leave behind and, and allow a patient to survive an operation. What we can do is get the radiologists to put a needle into the liver, <coughs> into the main vein that comes into the right side of the liver, and we deliver particles that slowly sludge up that blood supply. And what that does is, it, and this is the line between the right and left side of the liver, it causes the right side of the liver to wither away and the left side to grow ahead of actually doing the operation. And this means that then there's a, a large enough piece of liver left behind um, uh, to sustain somebody immediately after surgery. So there are some things we can do to help with this. It, it's not something we commonly do in neuroendocrine tumors, but it, it, we do do it from time to time. I'm gonna move on now to talk about uh, embolization for liver metastases. And um, this is a procedure that's done by interventional radiologists. There are um, no need for an anesthetic. It's um, done by an artery in the groin. So you're awake and while it's going on and, and you can see the catheter, what's happened, if you imagine the groin down here is that a catheter has been passed up the aorta, which is the main artery. And the radiologists have then inserted this into the hepatic artery here. And the curious thing about neuroendocrine liver metastases is that they derive most of their blood supply from the arteries in the liver. And you can see that when 
the contrast, which is what makes these arteries white, is injected into those arteries, is that these light up these tumours within the liver in comparison to the normal background liver. And, and what, that, what the radiologists then do is to deliver particles to block the blood supply to those tumours. It can be simply particles that block off the blood supply or particles with chemotherapy attached to them, or occasionally, and this is not available on the NHS currently, uh, there are particles with radiotherapy attached to them, uh, which can um, then sit there and deliver local, uh, radiotherapy locally to those tumours in the liver. So th there's no, again, same with surgery, there's no randomised controlled trials that tell us exactly the benefit we give, but we know that it's good for small widespread tumours that may not be so good or well suited for surgery. We know that, um, that, that sometimes multiple treatments may be required, but there's a partial effect in between 50 and 90% of patients. And even though the tumours might not disappear, the, the growth is halted for a year or two in those tumours. And again, it's about uh, setting the clock back on the disease with these sort of treatments. And we find it's a really useful adjunct surgery where the big tumours are removed and the smaller ones are then subsequently treated with embolization. And it's also really useful for the control of carcinoid syndrome and other syndromes. So the final thing I want to talk about is ablation. Um, I know, sorry, it's the penultimate thing. Um, ablation of liver tumors is something we rarely use for neuroendocrine tumors because we think surgery and um, embolization procedures are better. But the, the, the process is that um, you can see a tumour here in the back part of the liver, which lights up. Um, and what happens is that probes are placed under radiological guidance into that tumour. And we use microwave ablation. And microwaves effectively heat up a sphere of tissue and destroy that tumour within that, that region there. And so we, we occasionally use it in our neuroendocrine practice. And the, the sort of patients we use it in is uh, so this patient has got multiple tumours within the liver that have previously been treated by surgery and by embolization. And there was one in this area that was growing and we did an FDG PET scan, which is a sort of nuclear medicine scan, which suggested it was behaving a little bit differently to the other tumours within the liver. And so we successfully ablated that rather than uh, um, uh, having another major operation. So uh, that, that's where we would use it. So quite a niche role for, for in our practice. The final thing I want to talk about is transplant for neuroendocrine liver meds. This has just become available again in the UK on a trial basis, but there's very strict criteria. One of the problems with transplant is that there is um, a lack of organ donors in, in Britain and um, that means that they're in short supply, but the, the criteria that are being used, you have to be under 60 years old. You have to have grade one or two uh, disease. So with a proliferation index of less than 20%, the primary tumor, and this is mainly for pancreatic and um, small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors, the primary must have been uh, resected previously at least six months beforehand. And there needs to be, a, a, a substantial but not um, uh, huge burden of disease within the liver. And there need to be scans for six months before being considered for transplant before uh, you can be put forward to a transplant. And then patients who might be suitable are discussed in a national multidisciplinary uh, team meeting. And uh, so this is just starting up in the UK at the moment, so it's exciting times. And I suspect the criteria for transplant will extend in the future. So I think overall, it's, as I hope I've demonstrated, it's really complex decision making when we come to liver metastases. I think it's important for the MDTs that look after you to have all options and specialties open to them, because otherwise there can be some bias coming into treatment recommendations. As I've said to you before, we don't have good randomized controlled trials on individual local regional treatment modalities, and I don't suppose that will change soon. So it's still down to the MDT uh, opinion. And, and one thing that we all talk about at conferences is what sequence of treatments we should give. 
uh, because of the wide variety of treatments available, we still don't know the right order for those. And we need to also be mindful of doctors that all treatments can impair quality of life. And, uh, um, and, and that's why when we have a, um, when we come to a view about what treatments might be best, it's very important we sit down with you, the patient, and talk about it in clinic.